damage. More of it is better, but how much more of it is more better? That's the real question we're going to answer today. If you want to optimize in Pathfinder 2e, you will need to care about things way beyond the scope of just how much damage you are dealing. But that is not what this video is about. This video is purely, and I mean purely, about how much damage can be dealt, how we measure that, and how much that damage is actually worth. Because, yeah, there are a lot of points in this game where you can give up some damage to get utility. And I want to give you the tools to analyze when that is worth it. So, with that, let's go ahead and get started because some of the devs have actually already made great Twitter threads on this topic that I just want to quickly go over so we can all have a common understanding of what we are talking about. And here's Michael Sayers' thread, and they are the current design manager at Paizo, or one of. And you can see in this thread, it is all about how damage per round is often used as a metric for class comparisons, but it is often one of the clunkiest and most inaccurate measurements you can actually use, missing a variety of other critical factors. And this is going on about overall class balance, but I really want to highlight that there are some other measurements proposed here that are superior very early on the thread. TAE, Total Action Efficiency, and TTK, Time to Kill. If you're trying to build a pure damage character, Time to Kill is the actual number that you are caring about. That is how long it takes for you to get an enemy on the ground. The time it takes for you to kill an enemy. A damage character wants to kill things faster. People use damage per round as a substitute for how long something would take to kill, but that isn't really true. And we will see exactly when that can be tricked in Mark Seifter's thread later on. And this thread is going into details of how many actions does it take for you to do what you want to do? Does it require extra support from your teammates in order to get there? And it talks about what factors will break a white room scenario. And so I'm going to slowly scroll through this. You can pause and read it or keep on rewinding the video to watch it so I can get more watch time. But I want to use this as the starting point for the discussion, not just me reading out the thread out loud. These metrics conclude whether a class has a very large damage output, but it's also significant drain on party resources. And I really want to highlight this party resources term because that's your group's HP, that's your group's spell slots, that's your group's focus points. Because if you can just blue blop right through everything, you will not need to stop and rest. You will not need to take long rest. You will not need to refill focus points. And you could, in theory, do that. So drain on party resources is really the end goal of a lot of Pathfinder characters. You want to be able to get through fights having spent the fewest slots as possible, having spent the fewest daily activations of battle medicine as possible, having spent the fewest resources as possible. And that's really the central goal. And having high damage means you end fights faster, which means you're probably not spending as many resources. So people tend to go damage as a very good thing when you're trying to save on party resources. And it goes into detail on how champion actually mitigating damage has worse time to kill, but frequently has parties save on resources compared to a fighter in that slot. So optimization happens at the table, not the character sheet. Very true. However, not what this video is about. So that's the gist of this thread. This thread is about how you are going to be a functional character. And as long as a party is working together, and somebody's doing some mound damage, you're gonna be fine. And that's like the big broad stroke idea here. And Mark Seifter's thread is the one that is more closely aligned to this video. Even if you do only care about damage, DPR is an okay, but not great metric. Let me show you through an extreme example. Uh, they started writing a play test or joke class with the trap trait for beats that look good under specific lens, but are actually obviously terrible after you start analyzing them in the big picture. So this was Omega Strike. One action, you make a strike. On a success or critical success, roll a D100. On any result but 100, no effect. But on 100, 
you do a thousand times as much damage as normal. If you put this on DPR spreadsheet, I can tell you what happens. One out of 100 times a thousand. Let's pull up a calculator so I can do this. Now I can actually show you what's happening. One divided by 100. Obviously, it's only activating 1% of the time, 0 0.01. But if you're getting a thousand times the damage, not 1%, you're multiplying your average damage by 10. Your DPR is 10 times higher. Isn't that great? You are literally giving away your strike, doing nothing 99% of the time. But if you're only looking at DPR, it looks incredible. And that's the thing. DPR does not account for swinginess. So if you go onto Reddit and you see people talking about, oh, but actually pickaxe fighters because of the fatal trait and fighters increased accuracy have higher DPR on average. Yes, they do. But they're also kind of having this effect where you're giving away a lot of damage on your normal strikes for bigger crits that are probably just overkilling massively. And thus, I would argue that having a more basic weapon without the fatal trait is still better for fighter as a class. Because fighters like to do their stuff and tend to get normal hits as well as their crits. And another reason that I'm going to dock against swinginess here, the high variant strategies, is when you dig down into it, as a Pathfinder party, you are going to need to win, let's say you have eight encounters per level and you're playing a one through 20 game. You have 20 levels with eight encounters each. Oh, come on. Calculator 20 times eight, 160 encounters you need to win. And if somebody dies in one of these encounters, you need to do a resurrection or if you, your GM does not have resurrections easily available, they're rolling a new character. So if you want to keep your character one through 20, you need to have a strategy that can consistently win all 160 of those fights in over the course of a campaign. High variant strategies like Omega Strike or Fatal Flick Pickaxe Fighters are worse when you look at them as it only takes one fight to kill your character. I'm going to say that again. It only takes one fight to kill your character. So I tend to build for the worst normal case. Um, so this is a dock against builds that have high variance, but would otherwise kill it on DPR. And then goes further, talks about power attack, which people say is a bait feat because it doesn't do as much damage as just striking twice. And here you can see, oh, but at certain enemy at hit point thresholds, a single power attack might get them to the point where they're dead and you don't need to hit two normal attacks. And this is something that you'll see pretty frequently at lower levels when HP numbers are lower. Going for the vicious swing and going for that big two action damage activity might actually push your normal hit damage to the point where you are frequently one shotting the enemy. It has more use than just what the DPR spreadsheet would have you believe. The game, even in terms of its damage, is more complicated than a single DPR number. Does this attack kill the foe? This is an important point to note. The value of a strike is basically non-existent until it kills a foe. Let me explain what I mean. Basically, hit points are just a number that goes down to say, hey, when this number reaches zero, you win the fight. That's the point of hit points. That's what they do. And if you are in a boss fight, does hitting the boss with a strike make the boss less scary? No, they're still going to crit you on a 12 and that is going to be your life. That's just how these things go in this game. But if the boss was at like 10 HP left and you hit them with a strike, you might make that boss a lot less scary because they can't kill you while they're dead. So with that in mind, that idea in mind of a lethal attacks are the ones that are the most important, we can then analyze, okay, why do people find a bunch of smaller creatures easier to deal with? 
And I think that's because when you are in an average party, you have a lot of characters focused on damage because people are not necessarily optimizing the way I would. Um, hashtag wrestler for life. But you instead have a lot of people focus on damage. And damage can actually make fights easier in an encounter with a lot of enemies because you remove an enemy from initiative order and now the enemy is only threatening a fraction of what they were before. And now that the enemies are only doing a fraction of their damage, you can now put more resources into more damage and you can keep on snowballing. However, if you are a mostly damage oriented party and you're in a boss fight, that tactic does not make the fight easier. And the boss, because again, you have 20 times eight encounters to do with 160 encounters. Some of those are going to be boss fights. Let's say 20% of them. You have to deal with 32 solo bosses. How long until one of them gets a nat 20 turn one? And somebody's on the ground. And then the boss gets to start snowballing in the same way you were snowballing against the mooks. Because if you do not have consistent healing, consistent damage mitigation, one of those solo bosses is going to just beat you. You are going to lose a character that way. So damage has different value and a different job in encounters with a lot of enemies versus a single enemy. Against a lot of enemies, the thing that damage does is it reduces the enemy's offensive power. Against a solo boss, it ticks down the timer to where the fight will inevitably end. So that's why there's a big tactics difference between the two. Against a lot of smaller enemies, the traditional advice you're given is just deal damage and try to get people out of initiative order, which is great. And against bosses, the advice that you are given is you need to do stuff that isn't just damage and affect the math of the game because that's the only way you can make that fight easier partway through it. And then more nuance gets added to the discussion. I talked about how there's a strike against fatal builds because they have high variance, but you see, the thing is that crit from the fatal build might be the thing that removes somebody from initial order. It might be the thing that gets that boss on the ground that round earlier and saves you resources where the normal hit damage might just be enough, depending on where the thresholds are, depending on all kinds of factors. It's perfectly valid as a choice. I personally do not like it because I want to minimize variance as much as physically possible, but that can be fun. And that's really what matters. Non DPR metrics are sometimes better for the fatal and other traits. Sometimes they're worse. You should use a wide variety of metrics, not just pure probability DPR and spreadsheet math. Because like I can do the spreadsheet math. I have the spreadsheets to prove it. I did want to figure out the value of the dazzle condition, which I'm going to show off at the end of this when I show the actual mechanics of how to calculate your damage. But I want to start this video off by clearly stating what I'm showing you on my spreadsheets is not necessarily fully accurate to the game as it is played. I'm also going to scroll because like if you want to read Mark's words over there, you can keep on doing so. Uh, metrics are always going to be situational. You need to think about what your metric you are using and why. DPR's biggest flaw and the main reason it can weaken overall analysis is not because it's a bad metric. It's actually pretty decent if you don't get suckered into thinking it's universal and all be all. But it's one of the metrics that frequently causes that issue. Do not just look at DPR, say this number bigger, this class better, or this number bigger, this build better. Try to dig in and see what other factors are around that. Because it could be like what Michael mentioned with, you may have issues with action economy, with more resources need to be expended, with other party members might need to be spending more actions to support this thing going on. Or it could be one of the builds is providing those support benefits and then letting another build be more efficient later on the turn rotation. So 
With that out of the way, we can now finally talk about how to actually get the DPR for one of your builds. So here's my favorite DPR calculator. It lets you do a lot of very powerful things. And I want to explain how to answer a question using this and then explain why that answer is not the end all be all. So if I wanted to say, hey, I want to see early game how much damage my dual wield fighter will deal compared to a rogue basic striking. I don't want to say that. The first thing I'm going to set up is the rogue because that's going to be the easiest. So I'm going to click create new routine. And so what this says is I'm going to create a new thing to be measuring. I'm going to name this rogue two strikes and I'm going to have it be with rapier. And I'm going to pick rogue as the class chassis. I will note these are all the pre remaster class chassis. So stuff like cleric war priest will not be fully accurate. The master at 19, all that kind of stuff. But uh, there are ways for you to manually adjust those types of things, which I will go over soon. But as I said, for this one, we are looking at a rogue where we are going to be doing sneak attack damage because that's part of what rogue is going to be trying to do. And we will be basic striking. The damage diver rapier is D6. We're going to give it the critical specialization of sword. Starting at level five, because that's when rogues get their critical specialization. And it will have deadly D8. So there we go. It's only going to be that one weapon. We're going to make two attacks with it. Create the activity. And you see, bam. There is the rogue making basic attacks. And you can see here, it lets me adjust things like, ooh, how much damage or what level uh, do I want to look at for each of these things? And so this is actually talking about where you get your elemental damage runes implemented, which is right here. And I can say, oh, you can see it implements the damage rune at level eight, which is when you first get the elemental damage runes available because they're level eight items. And then at, when you get an item bonus increase and to your weapon, you can get another rune on there and it's just going to assume you're putting on another damage rune. So that's automatically factored in for you. And it has effect on crit flat footed or off guard as it is post remaster because it is a sword and that is the sword critical specialization. And I can then hover over this graph and I can see different spots of how much damage it's expected to do against various levels of enemy uh, based on your level. And say if the enemies are much higher level than you, what's the average damage look like for an attack? If I'm much higher level than them, what's that damage look like? And then I can also go into just like the first attack and I can go into its role and I can actually add in another bonus. So if I want to say, but they have a bless going on, I can give them a plus one bonus to hit. And that's how you'd go do that kind of stuff. I'm going to just get rid of that bonus though, because we don't need it right now. And now I'm going to go make the thing with fighter. And so with fighter to keep things simple, they're going to be double slicing using two weapons. I'm going to make them dog slicers. So it'll be D six agile. And I'm going to manually add in the bit of damage from backstabber. Actually, you know what? Let's just call them short swords. Keep the math easier. You'll see that the one or two points of damage from backstabber will not really matter here. And so I'm going to say use two weapons, previous attack zero, using double slice with D6 agile and D6 agile, both in sword. And I'm going to create a new activity. And look at that. You can see fighter leagues ahead of rogue. The double slice is way better than attacking twice as a rogue. I'm going to percent of selected routine, include the baseline so the chart starts at zero. You see, the fighter is doing like 50% more damage. Because this percent of selected routine has the graph go from being about who is doing more on an absolute value sense, where the level differences start to look like everything diverges more later on. You can see that here, but if you go into percent of select routine, 
it all normalizes that. So whatever build you have currently selected, like my rogue, I currently have that selected. It, it shows that as your one. So you can then see, oh, this is 0.5 above. So it's 50% above thereabouts against all level foes. Against higher level foes, it actually goes to like nearly double. And against very low level foes, uh, it goes down to around 20% up. But double slice does require both hands. It does require all these other downsides. It might require more setup, getting knocked out, needing to pick up two weapons, etc, etc, etc. Rogue could also be doing other activities with the rapier strikes. It's various other things. But when people complain about damage, they're usually just looking at this graph and calling it a day. Before I move on, though, I do want to go into one other thing. So if I decide to focus in on the fighter, you can see the rogue is actually doing around 60%, where if I flip it back the other way, uh, like so, you can see the fighter is at worst 50% better, and it spikes up to like 75% better there, where if I, again, focus on the, the fighter, you can see the rogue goes down to about, I don't know, 70%, and maybe as low as 60 in a few areas, 57 those don't line up perfectly because you have Rogue is 40% worse, but Fighter is 50% better. That's important to note. And there is a mathematical reason for this. So let me explain what I mean with two theoretical builds. A deals 40 damage per round, B does 10 damage per round. So it's easy to say... Build A is four times as good. There's a 400% improvement for 400% total betterness. Build B is one quarter as good as A in terms of damage. 75% decrease, 25% total efficiency. You look at the numbers for B and if I say, oh, it's a 75% decrease, that doesn't hit quite as hard as a 400% improvement despite both things being mathematically correct. So when you're looking at this type of measurement where you're comparing something as being better or worse than, the differences are going to be exaggerated when you look at the worse build as your primary source. Because this is having it spike up to be 75% better. And you can see that otherwise... Uh, da, da. it'll dip down to be not even uh, 0.6 times as good. So a 40% decrease is where it dips. And that's because of this two builds idea where the percentages seem smaller if you're measuring how much something is decreasing just because that's how our brains work. So just note that when you're comparing builds by using this uh, percent ratio thing, that you are careful to not be tricked by the numbers looking bigger or smaller than they are just because your scaling is a bit different. And again, I don't think absolute value is that helpful. Um, and also, if you want to change exact properties of these creatures, you can do it with these sliders. It also has a single level graph where you can look at various levels of the game and see how much damage they do. And you can see the clusters of damage on hits and crits. So you can actually get a histogram of how much damage you do on each attack. You can set the HP of enemies so that you can see wasted damage go away. And it's just really neat. Uh, yeah, this is a good tool. I'd recommend using it if you want to see how efficient you are being, but uh, I now want to get into detail on how do we use this for an actual build decision? So I am comparing for, I need to be a damage dealer for my party. And I'm going to look at me using a D12 weapon and attacking twice in a turn, usually doing about that much damage. I want to compare it to what if I wanted to play a brawler 
and do grappling stuff and let other allies do damage. And that's how I provide utility. I don't want to use D6 agile weapon with stuff like combat grab and snagging strike to do so. And so I do this where I then have two attacks here. And I then click here. And I'm just going to say that add effect always effect is on success or better make them off guard and you can see you're only losing uh do 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 a little bit of damage and you are now able to make them off guard or grappled very consistently is that worth it for your party it depends on how much this off guard bonus will matter to something like a champion because let's say you have a paladin in the party and so then you can go ahead and quickly model a champion who is just using a pole arm and da da da. We'll be making probably two attacks, create the activity. Then you can go ahead and copy this. Two strike with off guard enemy. And then you simply take the roll and you add a bonus of two. Over this one, you add a bonus of two. Hey. It appears your champion gains the 20% damage right back on their stuff. But now how much is the champion doing compared to what you're losing? This is where you need to take an absolute value count. So at level 13, it's about a difference of... Eh, let's call it nine points for the fighter. You are losing about nine points as well. So you can see it turns into about even. And then you take into account the other factors and you think, okay, I have weaker reactive strikes, but I apply grabbed more often. It makes it so I'm not going to be doing stuff like intimidating strike. And now you can have an informed idea of what you want to do based on the numbers. That's how you use a tool like this. It's not a simple, oh, you can see, looking at graph, this number higher, so therefore better. Uh, no, you have a party, this is a team game, and you should think around how do I do stuff so that way it helps my team the most. That's my soapbox for this tool. Now I want to get into how good is a plus one anyway. And so I did what any self-respecting software guy would do when proposed a basic math question, and that is write up some 40 lines of Python code and have it so that way other people can fork it and mess with the code and do stuff with it. Because this is just in Replit, you can look up how to use Replit, it's fine, and I have it so that all the modifiers an end user would want to modify are all just up here. So. Let me explain what we're doing from a mathematical lens first. So basically in the game of Pathfinder second edition, we have a target number. We need to roll on a D20 and I am simplifying it to a target number on a D20. And this just simply means the target's AC is seven higher than your attack modifier. So if you are a level one fighter with a plus nine to hit, this represents a creature with 16 AC you need to roll a seven on your D20 to actually hit that creature. And so on numbers one through six, you miss and you deal zero damage on numbers seven through 16. You hit and deal one strike worth of damage on a crit. You're doing two strikes worth of damage. So we add all this up and then divide by 20 to get 0.9. And I'm just using the average function Excel just to show this faster. And basically, this is the type calculation we need to do. And so in this, we will actually need to iterate in a couple different ways because we're going to need to tick up the ACs of the creature. And we're also going to need to check every D20 roll. So we do this with a couple nested for loops. And for loops just basically say, Every number in this range, do something with it. This one says for every number in this range, do something with it. And so in this case, 
Uh, we pick NAC to start with, which is a really low number. We then start a running total. We roll a d20, see if we hit, miss, critical succeed, whatever in this function here. It just does it. You can read the comments to figure out how it does it. Uh, if you crit, else if, else if, else, blah, 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 blah. Then handle natural ones and 20s. And then it just checks if the result is certain things to figure out what you did. And I have damage miss and damage crit miss as separate things because there are feats like certain strike that will, of course, change this because this actually has a failure effect of your attack would deal some amount of damage. So you could factor that in by saying your miss is like 0.25 damage and maybe you are using a fatal weapon. So crits are actually more like three times and you can run this. And you can see that, oh, look, now you're getting uh, more damage in various levels and blah, 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 blah. Also, if you wanted to say, okay, well, how good is it for me to go for like a trip? You can say that critting isn't that important to you. Normal missing is just a wasted opportunity and critical miss because you fall prone is minus one value. And then you can do that and you can see the value of your trip. And... There's some weird rounding floatiness to it. That's just because that's how floats are. I could clean this up, but I don't want to. Uh, this is a hacky bit of code. Other people can do stuff with it. Um, it looks clean if you don't put in weird decimals over here. So that's good enough for me. Um, I'm going to set this back up to its default settings. Where you're just dealing one normal hit damage, two damage on crit. Look at the base attack modifier of the character is zero. So that we're just getting the target value you need to roll. And then I took like what target numbers are one through 20, put that in this Excel sheet and then started playing with it. Just started playing with the numbers, seeing what I could get out of it. Because I was trying to evaluate how good is Dazzled. Because I had a session where Dazzled felt really strong and I wanted to see why. So I put all my numbers in. And my first instinct was to compare it to minus two accuracy. Different day, I wasn't exactly happy with that take. But basically, why that was my first idea was look at how often a minus two would affect something. So for this, it, in the seven to hit scenario, the minus two accuracy would only matter for here because those would turn to a miss. And these here would turn into a normal hit. So you're really reducing the damage only by like that amount. So we should see the damage is reduced by 0.2 ish. And we kind of see that going from seven to 0.7, it goes down by 0.2 ish. That's what this does at the enemies are pretty likely to hit area. And if the enemies are only ever normal hitting, what is actually happening is there isn't a green section and it only matters about 10% of the time. And now, let's think about what Dazzled does. So Dazzled says, basically, and this is just how you can mathematically think about it. This is not actually how the rules work, how the dice order works, but probabilistically, what is happening is a time that you would normally be hit, there is now an extra chance the attack is fully negated. So therefore, a Dazzled is just 80% of the time the attack still goes through, 20% of the time it just dies. And the reason I'm saying that 20% is because it is a DC five flat check because it dazzled. And so DC five means only four numbers fail it. One, two, three, four. Any number aside from that on the D 20 is of course going to hit anyway. So that means that for dazzle to work, it has a 20% chance to make the enemy miss. That's just how the numbers come out. Do not tell me that it is a 25% chance to make an enemy to miss, because I know some of you are typing that up. Um, yeah, so I can then compare that by multiplying this across and 20% chance to miss. So when they're only hitting on 10 numbers, there's about a little bit mischance there, the crits. So I mentally configure that to be, it should probably be close. I put into my little spreadsheet here and that's a pretty close approximation. So minus two and dazzled are pretty similar value. In the same way, I kind of compared blind to uh, minus five and minus six. 
blind is uh when enemies are less likely to hit you gets better uh but like not really it's there's a bit of fuzziness but blind is pretty close to like a minus five minus four accuracy like somewhere in here so blind very strong status condition you didn't really need me to tell you that much but dazzled is actually pretty good as well and people say minus two accuracy feels good to use but dazzled feels too swingy for a lot of people because it only matters on 20% of the time-ish. A minus two only matters 20% of the time-ish. Because look, it only matters for, again, these numbers and these numbers are where a minus two would matter. Dazzled could in theory matter for any of these over here, but only a bit of the time. Why you see the difference for Dazzled averages is it can fully get a crit rather than just reducing a crit. But it isn't that much swingier than a minus two is. So I think people heavily undervalue Dazzled, and I came to that conclusion by doing this kind of spreadsheet math. So yeah, Dazzled is good, and spells that Dazzle are better than you probably think they are. Shout out to Revealing Light, my homie. Uh, area of effect, reflex save in the Divine list, hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> there are very few reflex save spells in Divine, we take what we can get. Dazzled, pretty good. Because if you thought about giving an enemy minus two status penalty to hit on a failed save for a couple rounds, that's probably pretty good. This spell gives Dazzled on a successful save for a couple rounds, which is really good. So, yeah. That is the type of things you would do in order to measure damage, find the value of different things. And I hope this video is helpful. So with that, I'm going to sign off. I'll see you later.